Xing, president of the Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence, joins me now live here in our studio, decked out with AI generated art. Eric, I hope you uh, are enjoying uh, what you see around you. Let's start with this recent letter calling for a pause in AI development. Some of the biggest names in tech calling for AI labs to stop their, uh, the training of powerful systems for at least six months. They are citing profound risks to society and humanity. Profound risks to society and humanity. That is a very, very, very big allegation. What's your perspective? Do you agree with that? I can only say that I agree in partially. <laughs> uh, I saw many of the names of my colleagues there, but also I see many names uh, of my colleagues not there. Mm. I think, you know, people on both sides calling for regulation, suspension, or advocating that are trying to say the same thing, which is uh, AI is reaching to a point that it requires, you know, people's attention and the government's retention mm. in terms of uh, litigating and uh, managing the consequence and the risk. But uh, people disagree on the methodology and the approach. Well, let's talk about that, because the UAE is a country that really had some first mover advantage, certainly very visibly uh, in the world of AI, be it the university that you teach in or its integration across government bodies and policies. How do you see AI playing a role in government? And should it be government? And I've listened to Sam Altman from OpenAI, one of the tech titans who could really make an enormous amount of money out of AI, talking about the importance of government regulation at this point and, and, and where to draw, in, draw the line under its development. What's your perspective? Yeah, indeed. I think that led her stop short at making the clarity of the difference between mm. basic R&D and also the application and accessibility of the product of R&D. Mm. I think what should be regulated and managed is uh, how technology are disseminated to the society, mm. how people should be using that, and what kind of a risk management should be in place. Mm. But uh, in terms of fundamental research itself, that's a different matter. Right? Mm. People and scientists have this uh, intrinsic nature of curiosity and discovery, mm. and that shouldn't be discouraged. Mm. And also, it is not stoppable. People will do it anyway. It, it is worrying, isn't it? You hear this, this great debate going on now about AI for good, and let's be quite clear, there are some enormous opportunities around AI, not least in the healthcare system, for example. But then the weaponization of this technology, that's, that's the worry, isn't it? The idea that this is technology that, unregulated, owned by what we might describe as bad guys, is, is really the big threat to, uh, as, uh, as many of these you know, big tech titans will say, that's the big threat to society and humanity. I want to uh, maybe uh, speak a little bit more on this uh, as a scientist. Mm. I think uh, the power and the capability of AI might be a little bit exaggerated at this point. It's just because the first time we see it. For example, if you are putting behind the scene to see how calculators are doing the, the algebra, mm. it is amazing. It is some, something that the people cannot do, right? Mm. You may view it's very smart. But uh, if I unfold the story to you, you actually know that it is doing only that but nothing else, mm. right? So ChatGPT and the big language models are very good at doing something which are very defined, mm. knowledge-based extraction and the question answering. Mm. But they they're a bionic cannot... search system, effectively, yeah, aren't they? It's built on basically the vast amount of uh, lingual knowledge mm. that is uh, written in text or maybe in conversation. Mm. But uh, human knowledge and the creativity and the many decision-making process mm. based on a more holistic body of information mm. that is not available to ChatGPT yet. A Stanford um, UI index report found that benchmark saturation, let me just explain what that is, this means, it, which is when a benchmarks become too easy for an AI system, is being reached at increasing speeds. I mean, this is sort of high level stuff. The reason I get you on tonight is, you know, you are steeped in this stuff. Could AI be developing at a rate faster than we can test it? And if so, just how worrying is that? AI can be definitely led to various different directions and could move even faster if the right benchmark is in place. Mm -hmm. I think right now, indeed, there's a limitation of the benchmark being limited to very knowledge-intensive mm. and the information-retrieval-intensive type of task.
but in terms of uh, creativity, theorization of, uh, of information, definition of uh, problems, and discovery of uh, truths, uh, I don't think there are benchmarks there or too many out there to mm. really uh, set a goal or, or chart, a, chart a path. Mm. Um, I actually would uh, be very, very excited to see there are other opportunities open to the foundation model technology that is behind ChatGPT. For example, in drug design, in climate modeling, and in energy mm. control, there are applications where indeed mm. human intelligence and the human capability are not yet able mm. to you know, you know, deal with the complexity mm. of the problem. Mm. So and that's, that's where, where you see the opportunity for good. That's where you see the, in, the enhanced opportunity, yeah? It is a much, much you know, stronger plus side of this technology. The artificial say. intelligence market, as I understand it, is set to reach nearly $2 billion in 2026. And I have to say, I wonder whether it isn't going to be greater be than that. Billion. Right. I, I, I thought that you'd say that to me. In the UAE alone, this is what I'm talking about, a $2 billion, uh, $2 billion by 2026. In the UAE alone, it's been an early adopter of the technology and is really helping to drive the industry forward. Before I let you go, given that this is your patch these days, this is the first place to have an AI minister, as I say, one of the first places that I... Was you know I noticed that that AI was being embedded across all departments. It was fascinating to watch its emergence so visibly. Tell us a little bit about the UAB being that early adopter and, and where you see those opportunities for this country. I think these opportunities will be all very rewarding in the in the long run because uh, UAE is among the fewer. Uh, early nations mm. to really embrace AI, to see beyond, you know, a uh, fuel energy driven economy, to move it into knowledge driven economy, and mm. AI is the driving force. Uh, being in the game and developing the domestic capability of uh, doing basic R&D is really putting U uh, UAE, you know, into the game, maybe mm. to have a upper hand position, you know, in the global competition. Mm. And also, don't forget about uh, the importance of uh, having the culture of STEM and R&D, you know, in mm. any country. So what sort of discussions are going on about regulation here, briefly? Um, as a university, you know, mm. we are very actively playing our role as a think tank to mm. help our government officials and stakeholders to understand the implication of AI in terms of uh, the technological nuances behind it, the risk and also the potential. Mm. And that's where we see the university play the best role, you know, in influencing the decision makers. Mm, fascinating. It's good to have you on. Stay in touch. I mean, this is a, a subject which is just only going to become more important to discuss uh, as we move forward. Um, you are well placed to help us out with that, Eric. Thank you thank very much. Thank you for much. having me here. Indeed. You are watching Connect the World with